The unsurpassed penetrating and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, we can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. I've been asked to talk about equanimity today. Equanimity is one of the four Brahma Viharas, the four immeasurable divine abodes of Brahma. Immeasurable, wide, limitless. And the other three are loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy. Equanimity literally means even mind or evenness of mind. Looking up in the dictionary, which I often do, it says it can mean fairness and impartiality, and it can mean tranquility of mind or temper, especially in difficult circumstances. Well, why is equanimity one of the four divine abodes, which are limitless in their nature? Well, you can see why loving kindness and compassion are limitless, sublime states or abodes, and sympathetic joy, well, it takes joy in the happiness of other people, okay, but equanimity, you know, compared with the others, it sounds a bit pale and spiritless and indifferent, even. But actually, equanimity is anything but spiritless and indifferent. To practice equanimity requires the cultivation of many Buddha's virtues. Stillness, acceptance, patience, fearlessness, strength, Faith, to name but a few. So I'll talk about a few. I found a really helpful quote about equanimity on Wikipedia. I often go to Wikipedia and some have some, some really good things. And this is a really nice quote by Gil Fronsdahl about equanimity. Neither a thought nor an emotion. It is rather the steady conscious realization of reality's transience, impermanence. It is the ground for wisdom and freedom and the protector of compassion and love. While some may think of equanimity as dry neutrality or cool aloofness, mature equanimity produces a radiance and warmth of being. The Buddha described a mind filled with equanimity as abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So equanimity is not a dreary, grey thing. It's full of warmth and humanity, warmth of being. Well, it's interesting that equanimity protects compassion and love, as it says. When we see great suffering, or we see great harm done that we can't do anything about, equanimity helps us to bear it, not to nourish hostility or ill will towards people we see harming others, but to try to keep an even mind to continue to cultivate compassion and loving kindness, both towards the people who are harmed and towards those who do the harm. And this is because, partly because we know that doing harm will eventually bring suffering on the person who does harm others. And so they need compassion as much as anybody, if not more. And then when you see great suffering that's nobody's fault, like a great tornado we just had or a great earthquake which we had not long ago, Equanimity helps us to remain still and offer merit and maybe help as we are able and not fall into blaming people for it. You can blame people, oh, it's climate change, oh, it's this, oh, it's that. But it doesn't help. So often after a great tragedy, we see an outpouring of compassion and help. And then people start looking for somebody to blame, just to help them feel better. What is their fault? Maybe we can, you know. Well, even if somebody is to blame, getting angry and righteous about it doesn't help. It just causes more suffering to us as well as to other people. We just get all angry and helpless. And we don't have to do that. We can learn from people's mistakes and their harmful behavior. We can learn not to do that ourselves. And in general, people can learn, okay, maybe we need to do something about the, the, the cause. But we don't have to be angry about them. An old monk said, anger, it's just compassion that's got stuck. 
Let us allow compassion to flow through us and not get stuck in our judgments. Equanimity is the relinquishing of judgment. It's impartiality, says the dictionary. It's fairness, not judging. And this doesn't mean dry neutrality or cool aloofness. It means seeing more clearly, with compassion for all of those concerned. People do terrible things, and if we really knew why they do them, we couldn't judge them. Not so easily. We'd have to have compassion. People who are happy don't do terrible things. Sometimes there might be a person in our life whom we find extremely difficult. Maybe they've ill-treated us or caused us great harm, whether deliberately or accidentally. And we find it very hard to forgive them. And this is where we need to practice acceptance and offer merit if we can. Acceptance of what has happened. We don't have to love the person, but we can try to stop feeding ill will and resentment. To notice that when it arises, ah, I'm having that thought of dislike again, or thought of resentment, or whatever it is. To notice when it arises, and to keep letting it go, over and over and over again if we need to. And really accept what has happened. This has happened, I can't take it back, I can't undo it. I just have to do the best I can with the consequences, and not harbour anger and ill will. Sometimes there's something still happening. We can't get along with a person that we're having trouble with, or the harm is continuing in some way. They may be oblivious to their effect on us and, to, on, and on other people, because sometimes people are like that. They're doing all this harm, and they seem to be have no idea, just bash through their life, leaving a wake of wreckage. Well, actually, there's suffering in that. Even the per if the person doesn't seem to notice, they get consequences later on. And if you can still have compassion for somebody who's like that, who does that, and we're like that too, to some extent. We forget, or we don't notice when we make a mistake. When you say a little crabby word to somebody, we don't always see them kind of blench, you know, or look, you know, cast over their face. We might just be angry or irritated, and then we bash on our merry way and not realize that actually we've hurt somebody. You know, we all can be like that. So, if other people seem to be oblivious, we are oblivious too sometimes. If we can really work on acceptance of what the things happened to us, the things that may still be happening, of ourselves, our own shortcomings, you know, we can have compassion. We can have compassion for others. We can have compassion for ourselves. And we can find equanimity. Acceptance of other people, acceptance of ourselves. The latter often harder, you know. Well, equanimity is not a static thing. You just, you've got equanimity and there you have it, bong, you know. Because like anything else that we practice, we have to keep working on it. And sometimes it's easier than at other times. Sometimes it's fine, you can accept something with equanimity. And other times it's just really hard, it sticks in our throat, you know. But it's really helpful to come back to equanimity. When you find ourselves getting a bit irritated or righteous about something, we can think, Equanimity, ah, oh. just come back. Oh yes, I don't have to get upset about that. And then when we are getting upset about something, we can consider, what am I holding on to here? Why am I getting all upset about this thing? Sometimes it seems out of all proportion to the thing is happening to us or the thing that you know, somebody did or said. Why am I getting all upset about this thing? It can be helpful to consider. Opinions. Opinions tend to be the antithesis of equanimity, especially when you have strong feelings invested in them. Political opinions, cultural opinions, opinions about what other people should be doing, or what we should be doing. Critical opinions, there's all endless, endless opinions, the exhaling of views. And if we can recognize an opinion as just that, it's just my opinion, it's not ultimate truth, you know then we can more easily let it go and not get too invested in it. Think, Wait a minute, what am I going with this puffy little opinion about something? It's just my view. I may be wrong. Somebody most else probably has a completely different view. Almost certainly if somebody has a different view, maybe I can just not let it carry me away. We might have all kinds of opinions about things we can do nothing about. 
And I find it helpful to notice when I start to worry or get indignant about something that I read on the news or whatever, I can reflect, well, this is samsara after all. Not that I don't care, but we don't expect this world, this life to be completely free of suffering, discomfort, things we don't like. This is samsara. This is where we live. This is what we've got. The world of patient endurance, as they call it. And our patient endurance can be also equanimity, acceptance, but not cold. It's not a cold endurance. It's not stony. It's more like, how do I live with this? How do I accept this? You know. We don't want to be indifferent and, and uncaring, but we don't need to carry it all around and get all upset about everything. We don't have to do that. If harm is being done, we can offer merit for everybody concerned, those who do harm, those who are harmed. And that really helps us. It helps us to keep a warm and open heart and not to just cut ourselves off in bitterness or resentment or, you know. Fairness and impartiality, as the dictionary says. To see beyond our likes and dislikes, our views, our tendency to grab onto the things we like and push away the things we don't like. And this helps us to work on our self-partiality, what I like, what I want, what I find comfortable, the people I like to be with, you know. Seeing things in terms of what we want and what we don't want. Not getting all upset when things don't go our way or getting too excited and elated when they do go our way, when it gets something we like. Um, not getting all wildly excited because it will pass. The things we don't like pass. The things we do like pass. Everything passes. Everything comes and goes. Equanimity means evenness of mind in all circumstances, both the painful ones <clears throat> and the joyful ones. Here are the eight worldly winds of gain and loss, fame and disgrace, praise and blame, elation and sorrow. I love those winds. Well, I don't really love the winds. I love talking about the winds. They're constantly here. They always blow. There's always one wind or another. Praise and blame, gain and loss. Right, here we are again, you know. And we naturally feel unhappy if we lose something we value or we're blamed for something. And we're happy if we get something we like or we're praised for something we did. It works out well, you know. Oh, that's nice, we did that. But it comes and goes, it passes. We do, like when I was a cook, you make a really nice pie. Everybody did love it. And then you make a soup and you burn it, you know. It's always like this. You do something really nice and then next day you make a mess of it. But actually it's all the same, you know. It's all the same. Or you make something completely perfect. Nobody even notices, nobody says a word. And you make, <laughs> you make something else that... You thought it didn't turn out so well, or it was too salty or whatever. People say, oh, it was wonderful, thank you, lovely. Who cares? You know, you just do your best. You do your best, and you let it go. It's going to be gone in a minute anyway, and you work all day, and then it's sucked down in a minute. So, <laughs> Cooking is perfect for this. It's perfect. Uh, fame and, you know, gain and loss, fame and disgrace and all that. Disgrace because you've burnt the soup. Well, not exactly. But just to see that little, you know, thing at work. Sitting still within these winds, which are always blowing, and to see them what they are, that's the practice of equanimity. All these things come and go like the wind. Everything comes and goes. They don't last. Nothing lasts forever. Even in the midst of great sorrow, you know, we might find a little equanimity here and there. They say that time heals all wounds, and we do get over things. If we allow ourselves to do so, we have to allow ourselves to get over things. Broken hearts do heal if we let them. We don't keep stabbing them again. Sometimes feel, you know, if somebody's lost somebody they dearly love, they might feel that to live again, to take a little bit of joy in life, is somehow betraying that person who they've lost. I shouldn't be enjoying anything. I should be sorrowing forever. Well, surely the person wouldn't want them to spend the rest of their life miserable and in sorrow. You'd want them to live their life. And it'd be a, it can be a kind of a clinging to the past, to something that's gone. It'll never come back. The person will never come back. That slight, sweet taste of sorrow reminds us of the person, and we don't want to let it go. But actually, it's not necessary. You need to live, you know. 
the practice of equanimity is really the practice of letting go. Let go a little, you have a little peace. Let go a lot, you have a lot of peace. Let go completely, you have complete peace, says that Jancha. Exactly that. Letting go completely. Well, we can let go a little, you know. Sometimes we have to let go a lot. And the more we can let go of the things that come through our lives, the more we can find peace and equanimity, contentment. And it's not, um, <clears throat> as I said, it's not not caring. It means not grabbing on to things and getting too upset or getting too excited and elated if there's something we like. No. Fear. Sitting still in the midst of fear. That's a source of great strength and comfort, both for us and for other people. We know what it's like when there's something frightening that happens and there's somebody who is not all upset and running about. They're just sitting still, saying, oh well, this will pass. My mother used to say, it'll all be the same in a hundred years, you know. <laughs> or worse things happen at sea. You know, just a little sort of comforting thing in the midst of something that has happened that you don't really like. Or when there's something really awful that happens. You know, there's a lot of fear in our world at present, saber rattling and people getting afraid. But we can sit still. We can sit still. If we allow our mind to think of all the what, what this could happen, that could happen, what if, what if this, you know, it's, it's useless. But to sit still and practice faith. Because sitting still in the midst of fear is based on faith that somehow things will work out for the best. Things will work as, as they need to. And within all of it, there is that which sustains us, that which embraces all of it, everything, it come, is embraced within that which is greater, bigger and deeper than anything we can know. To sit still within that, to keep coming back to that. We can take refuge in that. And that's our source of stillness and strength and comfort for ourselves and for others. Coming back to our quote, which I said at the beginning, it's, equanimity is neither a thought nor an emotion. It's not just an intellectual idea, and it's not just based on emotions and feelings. It's deeper than all that. Seeing beyond both thinking and feeling. Seeing beyond our self-view, our partiality. I like this, I don't like that. Seeing beyond our little tiny view. Practicing wisdom, actually, is what it is. Just sitting still with equanimity is to practice wisdom. And as our quote says, equanimity, neither a thought nor an emotion, is rather the steady, conscious realization of reality's transience. The steady realizing, constantly coming back to impermanence. Reality's transience. Everything comes and goes. To see impermanence in all the conditions of our lives, both the welcome and the unwelcome. Impermanence in the blowing of the eight winds. And not to cling on to any of it, and not to reject any of it, to let it all come and go, you know. To let go of our selfishness, our self-partiality, our little self-view. I like this, I don't like that. And then, when we do that, we're making room for the radiance and warmth of being, as he puts it. I like that. Radiance and warmth of being. You can have that when you're not clinging to your little tiny selfish view. So, equanimity is not a kind of cold, sterile thing. It allows radiance and warmth of being. We're allowing loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, the other divine abode, to fill our hearts. And we find peace. And the Buddha described a mind filled with equanimity as abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will, but actually full of loving kindness, compassion and sympathetic joy. And this is what we aspire to realize for ourselves. And that's it. Thank you. It's nice to see you all.